Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com and to the second part of my two-part build of an i3 Mini ITX PC. Last time I showed you all the components and I also fitted the CPU into the motherboard and fitted the cooler and the RAM. It's therefore now time to finish everything off and to run some performance tests. Right, it's now high time I started working on the case, so I'm removing all four screws and we can now hopefully remove the top panel. Inside there's all sorts of things that need to come out. There we are, there's power leads and various bits of hardware there. Um, some manuals in the bottom, they can very exciting, I'm sure we might look at those later. I'm also going to remove the power supply because if we don't take this thing out, I won't have any access. Right, there we are. Power supply is now removed. Put that up there. I'm also going to remove now the front drive bay panels. These should come out fairly easily. Let's get our access as good as we can. These should come out very easily, he says. They don't want to play game, do they? Come on, you little swines. There we are. That one comes out there. We also want the one removed from the three and a half inch bay. There, we're going to be using both these bays. Those are free. And then round the back, I'm going to fit the, um, the I.O. shield, the backing plate, that will marry this computer to the particular motherboard. Uh, as you may know, I hate fitting these things, and this is just, oh, that was very good. That's gone in very well indeed, all ready um, for the motherboard. And so now it's time for that great moment when the motherboard finally goes into the case. Never easy working in these tiny little spaces, but hopefully it will get in fairly easily. You can see why I needed the power supply out there. So that will go in here. I need to line it up. It'll come out, hopefully correctly, come out at the back, fit in there. Very good. That looks to be going rather well. And I now just need to hold that in place with, obviously, some screw. So if we can pick up a screw there, put that in, that'll start to go in. I just need to fit the four motherboard screws. Good, so motherboard is now secured. Next thing we're going to do is to start fitting some drives. Um, the first drive we're going to put in is um, this unit here, which is the, the SSD which I pre-mounted into this bay, which has got, as you may remember, our USB 3 ports on the front. So this will fit in here like this, and hopefully we'll poke out the front um, like that. And then once again, I need to start putting some screws in. Four screws will secure this bay. Right, and with that firmly secured, um, moving around a bit, um, the next thing I think is to deal with some wiring, both plugging in this connector here into the USB 3 header on the board, and also plugging in all of these wires here. Um, I don't have to connect these to the motherboard for audio because I'm going to use a separate sound card, but all of these wires do, do need connecting in. And as connecting those in is going to be rather tricky, you won't be able to get good access to, to see that, I'm going to do all that via the magic of um, filmmaking. So here we are, these are the wires that need connecting, and quite magically they're all now connected onto the board. Those are the wires that do things like the power switch, the reset switch, the hard disk light, etc. Next thing to do is to put back in the power supply. Uh, and I'm going to put this in next rather than fitting the optical drive because this, you probably can't see this down there, there is the 12 volt connector. And that's a rather tricky position because once that's in, I obviously won't be able to get anything in very easily. So the power wiring is going to be a little bit interesting, um, but hopefully this will drop back in without too many problems. You can see already I'm having some difficulty, but the location of the USB 3 header here is 
exceedingly problematic. Um, I think that's the nicest possible way to put that, exceedingly problematic. Um, you can't see that there, it's now just been persuaded to, to stay in place, but I'll put the screws back on the power supply. Always pick the right screws. There we are, the power supply is now fixed back in. Um, we also now need to fit in, it's getting rather tight in here, there's going to be some interesting cable management when I'm finished. Um, I just need to connect in the power supply connector again, I won't even attempt to show you how that's going in there, but it should fit in quite nicely down here. There we are, we now have power onto this board. And given that things are getting pretty um, tight in the case, I'm now going to fit in, I think at this stage, my SATA connectors. Um, I always like to try and use um, different colour SATA connectors for um, my boot drive and my optical drive. So here, if I can ever get into this ridiculously crammed computer now, I'm using a red SATA cable for my boot drive, finally got it in, and a nice orangey one for the um, optical drive. For my um, next and uh, getting closer to final trick, I'm then going to connect SATA to the SSD and also of course connect it to a power connector, it must have some power. That drive is now happy. Next thing to do is to take our older optical disc. This will hopefully slot through the front of the thing nice and easily. And before I slot it back too far, I will fit my SATA connectors. Uh, one for the data and again, Where's it gone? Where's the other SATA power connector? It must be hiding somewhere because I've just connected that one in. It must go to another one. Oh, it's right under my fingers, look. Right under my nose. They always are, aren't they? And this will connect in here. So if I just slide that back in, wow, it actually fitted. That's a bit of a surprise. going to be interesting getting those cables clear of the fan. Uh, and I can now take more screws and screw in the optical drive. Right, um, I think the next thing I'll do is to um, tidy up these cables again by some magical process. And uh, there we are, that's as, probably about as neat as it's going to get in here. Uh, for those of you who hanker after perfect wire management, I would make a mental note to either um, get some professional help or, or never build in a case um, of this size, I'm afraid. Right, you'll finally, you might have noticed there's some wires left. These are wires that are linked to the sound card. My last thing to do is to fit the sound card. This case has an interesting little uh, trick. You pull that screw out and this thing flips up. Uh, we can then lift out um, that from there. And that should then allow me to fit the sound card in. There's a very tricky little slot to hit in this PC and it's rather tricky to get in. You have to push it down like that and it drops in. You might be noticing I'm fitting here a um, PCI-1 uh, express um, device into a PCI-16 slot. Is it a great waste of the bandwidth? Yes, it is. Um, shouldn't be putting that screw straight in there, should I? I should be doing that first. Um, but they work perfectly well and basically this is a case of a needs have as, as needs must. I need this card and that's where it's therefore got to go. So that card is now mounted in there and I just need to find which of these is HD audio, it's that one and HD audio will connect to the card there. And that wire of course will neatly tuck or fairly neatly tuck out of the way. Maybe put a, a tag on that. And so now, having made a final check of all the connections and the connectors, I will attempt to put on the case. It's always the thing that defeats you right at the end, isn't it? But there we are, that's gone back on. And we have, with a couple of the uh, uh, obligatory case stickers, our final Mini-ITX 
i3 Haswell computer. Right, with the build complete and the PC nicely installed on my desk, I thought I'd show you a little bit of its performance. Here I'm running it onto a 720p screen with some slightly enlarged fonts and things so you can see things a bit more easily. This is not my standard desktop, but it'll allow people with smaller monitors to see what's going on or people watching this maybe on a smartphone. I've got here running up the top corner here um, a magnified version of the Core Temp Windows gadget, which is showing us the processor load at the moment, very low, it's just idling along, and it's showing us the temperature of the processor cores, each one of them, which as you can see is in the, in the very low 30s on average. As the machine's idling along, I'll also bring up a um, camera on a power meter externally plugged into the PC, so you can see we're using about, about 30 watts of power, so it's quite a, a reasonably energy efficient PC, and it's running at the moment um, quite a cool processor, uh, which is good to see, not least given the um, relatively small case all the parts were packed into. Down here, I've got Windows Experience Index. I know everybody hates Windows Experience Index. I'm not too sure these, these figures are, are brilliantly representative, but everyone's got this available to them, so it's worth having a quick look. Processor here coming out at 7.1 on the scale of 1 to 7.9. Only Microsoft has had a scale up to 7.9. Memory, I find it really difficult to believe the memory is performing that poorly. Um, graphics are 5.8, 6.6 for um, biz, uh, business graphics and um, gaming graphics, which is probably quite representative of the new Intel um, 4600 internal graphics. And the primary hard drive, which is our Samsung SSD, a 7.9 out of 7.9. I'd be reasonably sure that's right. Having said that, that doesn't really give us massive amounts of data. So what I'm going to do is to run Passmark. So over here is Passmark. I'll check it over that side so you can still see the temperatures running and of course the power meter. And I'm going to run all tests in Passmark. And this will do two things for us. It'll obviously run all those tests and we can see what numbers we get. I'll speed through most of them. But also as that thing runs, you can see our processor utilization is going up very significantly. And therefore we're seeing some rise in temperatures and we're seeing a rise in the use of power. Um, so we're starting to get a feel this machine, how it will work under load. They're getting temperatures into the, into the 40s, um, power use into the 40s, into the 50s there, over 50 watts of power drawn per second there. So this gives us an idea how the machine will perform over time. Still, I'm not too worried about temperatures or power use. Right, we're through the um, the core test of the processor there, and we didn't get anything above the 40s in terms of temperature or power. It's now going through all kinds of graphics tests. I'll speed through most of these, maybe to show you bits of the, the 3D tests. I'd also note that the machine will go through all sorts of resolution changes here, which my recording system will try and cope with, um, but you might see all sorts of weird effects on the screen um, as we go through. Oh, and here we are, aeroplanes flying over water, always a marvelous test. And this one's running um, pretty well, actually. The Intel 4600 graphics holding up very well there. Resolution change, we're now running 1024768 apparently, in the middle of the screen. Um, nice reflection, but some weird lines on the water. That's not what it's supposed to look like, but still not a bad performance. Now into, I think, the DirectX 11 test. Um, not perfect results here. We, we couldn't expect that maybe from our internal graphics. Ah, oh, and we're back to my favourite test ever, the one out in space with the, uh, the floating jellyfish about to overtake the world. What were they on when they came up with this particular test? And there we are, we've come to a conclusion, a pass mark score of um, 2008.8. Of course, what does that mean? nothing without some context. So uh, if we look at it here, I've got loaded as a baseline my Core 2 Quad uh, 2.8 gigahertz system with its um, GeForce GTX 650, which you saw be fitted in a, in a previous video. Um, interesting comparison there. That's the Core 2 Quad. This is the um, i3 Haswell chip. Um, so here the actual Passmark score of 2009 is just a little bit below the 2072 for the Core 2 Quad. Uh, the CPU mark, though, is, is better in the Core 2 Quad, you would expect it, but this machine 
it's respectable. It's getting, um, you know, over three quarters of the score. Uh, 2D graphics, this machine in theory comes out better. So what we think about that interesting when we think what Windows Experience Index said. Um, 3D graphics, inevitably, we're not going to meet the, the spec of a GTX 650, but it's not, not that bad. Um, memory, again, a much more reasonable score there. I think I would expect better scores here because the Core 2 quads running DDR2 memory, this is running DDR3, uh, and the disk mark also is better. Um, again, because we've got newer technology, um, that's got SATA 2 on board, the Core 2 quad, this has got SATA 3. So all in all, um, it's always nice to see some tests. I'm particularly pleased here to see the processor isn't getting that hot, given uh, we haven't got a lot of cooling in this very small case. The fact we're managing to come back down again into the um, just below or around the mid 30s and to be using about 30 watts of power is actually, I think, for this build, quite impressive. As I've shown you in the past two videos, it's now possible to build quite a respectable desktop PC into a pretty small case like this one. Indeed, if you look on Amazon, you'll see people selling final gaming PCs in this exact Element Q case, not just using an i3 processor, but also an i5, and in some cases, even an i7. Um, I really wish people luck calling an i7 in this case. But now that's it for another video and I hope to talk to you again very soon.